All right. Are we ready to go? Are we waiting? There we go. Excellent. Okay, good morning. Uh, thank you all for hanging in. I know it's the last session on the last day, and you guys probably have your brains full at this point. So really appreciate you uh, sitting in. And uh, if you're anxiously checking your flight statuses, I fully understand. It's all good. Um, we are here to talk about user settings today. But just because I can cheat, I'm also going to talk about some computer settings along the way, too. So i um, going to cover basically uh, how to manage the user experience and the user environment. And let's go ahead and move on to say, hi, I'm Katie. I'm the manager, one of the managers of professional services at Jamf Software. Uh, prior to that, I actually was a pro services engineer for about three and a half years. So uh, went around the world helping people out, uh, building new stuff, teaching them how to use our product and how to uh, make their own environments uh, better. Uh, prior to that, I spent about 14 years as an admin in higher ed. So. Um, Kind of been there and done that for a while, uh, back in from the days where Apple was constantly beleaguered. So I remember those days not fondly. But uh, happy to be here and uh, happy to start talking about managing user settings. Now, based on what I've seen this week and the people that I've talked to, this topic is probably not going to be super revelatory. You're not going to come out of here going, that was amazing. But if you learn one thing, then yay. And if you have reference material for later or anybody else on your team who couldn't be here, then that's what this is for. User settings, this topic is pretty esoteric. It's a little bit weird as you're starting to get used to uh, handling the Mac platform. And uh, I talked to a gentleman uh, a couple days ago who's like, yeah, this took me years to master. So probably not going to master it in an hour. But if you have reference material later, awesome. The slides are out there. Uh, my GitHub uh, link will be posted later on, uh, and of course, this will be recorded for your later reference. So I'm going to talk a little bit about the philosophy of managing settings, why we do things, what the settings are, where they live, how we might do these things, and then we're going to talk about some examples. I mentioned that I'm going to cheat. I am going to talk about computer level settings, and I have a couple uh, examples of user level settings. Uh, just to point out up front, the examples I'm going to be using are directed toward the Center for Internet Security uh, uh, benchmarks and remediation, because those have been pretty popular lately. So uh, NIST also released some benchmarks uh, and that are pretty close, actually. So uh, pretty similar topics as far as how to detect risk on your Mac and remediate that risk. So I've got a few examples, and again, all the code's out on GitHub, so you can refer to that later. The reason I'm here is because of a conversation that I had with a Windows administrator a couple summers ago. We had spent five days in very intense training. A uh, bunch of Windows admins in a little room, they're trying to wrap their heads around this Mac thing. And uh, the end of day five, I was getting a little bit punchy. And so I'm starting to give people odd tasks. I'm like, you, make that guy's computer sing the national anthem. You, do something strange with your company logo on the desktop picture. Like, just Go do things on the Macs now that you have the tools to manage them. And after about 20 minutes goes by, and one of the admins, he kind of catches my attention, and he, he pulls me over, and he says, so I've been researching how to do this. And there are a lot of ways to do it. I'm like, yeah. He said, what's the right way? <laughs> I said, the way that works. And he did not like that answer one bit. Windows admins, by and large, like the prescribed, this is how you do the thing. We don't have that in Apple land. There's a lot of different roads that go to the same end destination. And so we have to think about a lot of different factors, not just does it do the thing, but can my team also do that thing later? If I win the lottery and bail on this pop stand and you have to handle it later, can you do the thing tomorrow? So there's a lot of different considerations when we're talking about how to do settings, which is why I'm going to cover a lot of things and get into some stuff in some depth. I could make this the shortest presentation here this week, because here's my philosophy about managing settings. Don't do it. Drop the mic and I'm done. So <laughs> in general, my philosophy, and this is what I try to teach my customers and, and fellow admins, is don't get into the weeds with managing Mac stuff. 
as far as your end user experience, as far as needing to lock down. Everybody has the dock on the bottom and the, the trash can looks like this. And don't do that. Don't spend your time that way. Now, there's going to be objection. And there's also a use case for managing heavily. Uh, in my former life, I was uh, an admin in a uh, university. And we had managed computer labs. And one of the mandates of the labs was, if I log into this Mac in this building, it looks exactly the same as the Mac that I log into in the building over, in the building across campus, in the building up the road, in another city. That is absolutely a use case for heavy management, because you're not going to accomplish that without really getting deep into the settings and making sure that the user experience is consistent. In general, my, my recommendation to people who are not in that particular uh, world is that we manage minimally. We pick the bare minimum. And sometimes this is security related. Sometimes it's user environment related. Sometimes it's both. Uh, we pick the very specific things. We get surgical. We get precise. And we say, these are the things that I want to manage, just these little pieces, because they are vital to auditing. Because the end user experience would be negatively impacted if I didn't manage it. I have to put in that license key for that application when it launches, that kind of thing. Which leads me to one of my favorite quotes from the cartoon Futurama. And I live by this in admin land. If you are transparent to the end user, if you get out of the way so the end user can use the device, you did things right. People really shouldn't be aware that they're being managed. So this is how I teach. This is what I go for. This is what I advise my fellow admins to do. And since I've just spent several slides dissing the entire idea of device management, let's get into device management. All right. These settings primarily live in files called plists, property lists. They are primarily, often-ish, sort of human readable. And I'll actually show you some examples of things that are human readable and things that really aren't. We see them in a few different formats, but XML is really the most common. Uh, they're sometimes in text files as well. We're going to see, I have actually a good example from Apple itself. Like, really, Apple? Why is that on my computer? Um, uh, the point, actually, to, to take away from this is that uh, software vendors are under no major obligation to have major consistency or to meet any particular kind of standard. So we're going to see that also a little bit later on. But effectively, for my Windows admin friend uh, that I worked with, this is the registry. I like to draw, draw analogies to maybe bring them along a little bit and be like, so you know how you edit registry keys? They're even called keys. It's helpful. <laughs> totally. You're following this. So I mentioned that some of these things are human readable, that some of them really aren't. Um, that right there is the icon for Firefox in my dock. Of course it is. Uh, so there's a lot of uh, binary spew that you're going to see in plists. And then there's stuff that's actually kind of obvious. Like, oh, OK, my doc is on the right-hand side. This, some of these things are interpretable by humans. You can find it and realize, oh, yeah, yeah, that's the thing that I was looking for. And sometimes not so much. There's a bit of an art to digging into a plist and finding the values that you're actually looking for to manage. Where do these things live? This is going to be fun, because this is Apple's own documentation. That, that's, I don't actually know what's happening here. But the point of this <laughs> is that preferences can live across the OS in different places. And applications are going to look in different locations. And uh, they, applications are actually under no obligation to look in a very specific place. They might honor the root library preferences. They might not. The point is that there are preferences that affect all users on a computer. There are preferences that affect the computer itself. There are uh, preferences that only affect the user. And more than that, there are preferences that only affect the user on that specific piece of hardware. And if they log into another piece of hardware, it doesn't affect them at all. That's what this little chart is showing us. It's, I don't know, still not very clear. There is a reference there if you want to look that up later. Because, yeah, Apple documentation is a fun time. 
Uh, so I mentioned that these things can be stored across the OS. Of course, we have the root library preferences. This is where computer level settings are generally going to live. We also have the user directory for library preferences. OK. But then we start digging into user level library preferences. And there's this stuff called BiHost. Now, I mentioned that there are hardware specific user preferences. That's where that's going to live. But then sometimes we get vendors who get creative and put their own uh, directories in there. This is what I'm saying. Software vendors are under no obligation to make our lives easier. They might put stuff in strange places. And then there's the, it could be anywhere else, honestly. Things end up in strange places. P lists generally have a convention in their naming, and it's a reverse domain convention. Com.vendor.software title, usually with the extension of plist. So you'll have Apple's own preferences, com.apple, Microsoft, looking good so far. Jamf software, looking good. We change it up a little bit with video or VLC. And then there's this. I, I don't know why, but I mean, I had it in my preferences file, and that was that moment of, really? OK, thanks, Apple. So not even Apple is forced to follow this convention that is established and generally in place across uh, uh, most software vendors. Um, some of the more interesting exceptions have to do with scientific and mathematical software, which is usually not written with the Mac in mind. And so those preferences might live in very strange locations. Or they might even have a .txt extension at the end of it, because that's where the license file lives. So as we're looking at this and we're saying, what am I trying to modify? What am I actually trying to capture here? We have a few methods for understanding where preferences live and how to actually kind of zero in modularly. Remember, minimal management, surgical, precise. We're going to find that one preference that we actually want to affect. This is one trick, and it's the modification date. Say you go into your OS or you go into your user settings and you make a change. You move the dock to the right. You can actually, in your finder, very easily go into library preferences, sort by modified, and see if you can find what's going on there. What's the most recently modified? In this one, it's the system configuration. Probably I changed my date and time when that came up. So date modified, super helpful for kind of isolating that thing that you're looking for, that thing that you just modified. It's tricky, though, because there are invisible files, even in preferences. Things are not wildly consistent here. So we do have to at least know that this is a thing, and we can actually use a command uh, we'll get into defaults right a little bit more later on. But we can actually use a command to make finder files uh, visible. And when we do the same thing with our modification date, or in this case, we would actually sort by uh, alphabetical order, it's probably hard to see, but at the top there is dot global preferences dot plist. And dot global preferences, because it's a dot file, it's normally hidden to the finder. Uh, it contains a lot of interesting stuff. So this is one of those moments where we just kind of rely on the tribal knowledge of uh, people who came before us. Global preferences can hold a lot of very interesting things. There's two versions of it, by the way. There's the version at the root, and then there's a version for your user. And that might hold localization information. What language is my Mac speaking in right now? What time zone? How's my mouse behaving? And what's my preferred search engine? This is a mishmash of weird stuff that's stored in this one preference. I don't have a good explanation for why it's that way, but there's a lot of history that goes into how many years of OS 10, and we start just like, oh, we have this new thing, this new browser thing, and we have to have a preferred search engine. So yeah, we'll just jam it into this preferences thing, this global preferences that no one can actually see unless they trick the finder. So this is one of those just gotchas, just to be aware of if you're trying to figure out where does this preference live? I set it. I set Yahoo as my preferred search engine for some reason. How do I find that later? How do I manage that for the rest of my computers? Well, turns out it's hiding in your user level global preferences. And now, this one, I, I got to limber up a little bit. Probably going to make some people mad. Snapshots are one of those things people don't like. 
People on the internets really get upset about snapshots. They get worked up about this. There's a lot of very grumpy opinions about snapshots being, for whatever reason, insufficient or a bad thing to learn. Here's the thing about snapshots. What they're good for is determining what changed on the file system between doing a thing and stopping doing the thing. Maybe that was installing an application and launching it and setting it up the way you wanted. Maybe it was setting a preference for that application and being able to figure out what preference it is that you modified. Snapshots are great for that. Elsewhere in the ecosystem, you're going to hear that snapshots are bad and you should feel bad for using them. Here, I'm saying this is a great way to learn what preferences are modified. So in this particular case, for my text wrangler, uh, I wanted to see uh, how I set the registration to say, yeah, I've already registered my text wrangler. Totally have, by the way. Um, so if I've already modified or I've already changed that preference, I can come in here, use my snapshot to say, you know what? I'm going to set the computer to say, I've never done that. Take a snapshot. And I'm going to do that thing, take another snapshot, and then have it do a diff for me and say, this is the thing that changed just now. Now, this is Composer, very helpful tool. There are a lot of other tools that use this particular methodology, but Composer is pretty awesome. Composer also would let you, I don't know, hit that with a, a space bar and get you a quick view so you could see, hey, there's that key that I was looking for, the registration dialog. I can set that to true. This leads me, helpfully, into reading the keys. Now, you can see here that we have some tags. It's a pretty common XML format, right? You open the tag, you close the tag. There's a, there's a key, there's an element after the key. So what does this stuff look like? Well, I mentioned that vendors are not super interested in being consistent. So we can't always say that the uh, has run registration dialog or whatever that, that string was. We can't always say that that's going to be consistent across all of our, our different applications. Some vendors, you start seeing a pattern. And in fact, my friend Bill across the hall there, he actually was talking about managing settings for Office, right? And Office has been fairly consistent about how you can manage settings. So if you checked out his session earlier, I'm sure he'll have like profiles and cool stuff that you can use to actually work with that. Like I said, certain vendors, they develop patterns over time. So if you knew something worked in Office 2011, Probably something very similar works in Office 2016. I mentioned, and I'm going to keep mentioning this, we want to work modularly. We want to manage minimally. We're going to find the one or two very bare minimal keys that we actually want to work with. That data spew of my Firefox icon, that's not helpful. We don't need to impose that on everybody else. All I care about is put the dock over here. Or when I launched Microsoft Office, it looks like this. I say this a little tongue in cheek. The internet is actually super helpful for other people finding this same information. Uh, the community and ecosystem in the Mac world is amazing. And rely on your, your fellow admins. Basically, somebody has tried to ford this river before. So probably they know exactly what it is that has uh, changed over time. OK, so I showed you one example of a plist key. And that was from Text Wrangler. Here's another one. This is, uh, has launched before? Yes, cool. Sometimes, depending on the software title, this means that I'm not going to show you that splash screen up front to say, welcome to whatever product this is. Uh, you can also do the software update last check time, SU, super obvious what that means. No, it's not. But you start learning over time. SU usually means software update. And there's a timestamp in there. And if there's a timestamp in there, often that means that the product will not again check for an update. So if you want to manage that experience of the user is not prompted to update this app, you could actually just keep this key up to date over time. Have they agreed to the license? Yes. So in my uh, uh, school labs, when an, a student clicks and launches an application, the student should never be prompted to accept a license. The student should never be prompted to register an application. We had to get into here really de uh, in detail and pull these things out and manage that stuff. In real life, in a one-to-one -one Mac environment, particularly if uh, end users are admins, I'm not keen on managing that stuff at all. 
the user gets that first run, run experience. There's no harm in them clicking through a window and not reading that license agreement that they just agreed to. <laughs> I'm not cynical at all. <laughs> all right, here's another key list here. And uh, for Microsoft users, this stuff is pretty familiar. Like I said, they tend to follow a pretty uh, common format year after year, but it's rare to see vendors use slashes in plist keys. So in this particular case, when I launch Office, it knows my initials are KE, knows my name, it knows my organization, which means I'm not prompted to give that information when I launch the app. In a school environment, you might pre-populate the user organization with the school. You might pre-populate the username with school IT. Give it some initials like one, two, three, four. <laughs> The key types that we might be working with, and this is actually uh, documented on Wikipedia as far as uh, property lists for OS X. These are the different key types that we might see in a P list. So a string, pretty obvious, letters, letters and numbers. Uh, we might see numbers, so that's real or integer, and those should be interchangeable. We might see a Boolean, a true or a false variable. Uh, date, of course, we saw that earlier with the registration key. Data uh, is probably going to be that binary spew that we see for like the, the icons in a doc. An array might actually be several keys all pertaining to one particular topic. And the dict key is the dictionary, and oftentimes you'll actually see that wrapped around a whole bunch of XML stuff. So here's the thing. Vendors are not forced to be consistent. Every single value in their P list could be a string, even if it's a number. They're not under any obligation to meet any kind of standards. This is an art and not a science. You got to kind of poke through it a little bit and see what it is you're looking at. And can you translate it for something that can be managed later? All right. How do we manage that? The short answer is you have to have a management tool. I'm biased about management tools, but I'm going to set that aside for the moment and say MDM is a good way to do this. Meaning, if you have an MDM uh, option, you can deliver settings to your Macs. That's not the only option, though. You could do this with ARD. You could, if you were into pain, you could SSH into every single Mac you manage and do this by script. You have to be able to manage the Mac. You have to be able to reach it somehow, even if that's just sneaker net, lock up to every Mac and make the change manually. When we're talking about management tools, some common terms float to the surface. MCX, uh, I'll talk a little bit about that more later. Configuration profiles, of course, that's kind of the way of the future. We're, we're all kind of heading down that river together as far as um, delivering settings either by MDM or by quasi-MDM by delivering a profile and then applying it by script. Also scripts, going to talk about scripts a lot more later. That might be a little bit intimidating, but hopefully I can bring you along for that. Effectively, we can't talk about MCX at all, really. It's Gone by the wayside, Apple is not interested in supporting it so much for the current uh, OSs. I'm told that it still works mostly for El Capitan, but I'm not inclined to teach anybody to use that particular delivery mechanism. Configuration profiles have been covered at length by other sessions during this, this conference, and I know a lot of them have been recorded, uh, and so I'm not going to get really deep into that either, except kind of at a high level to say, we can deliver a custom payload with a configuration profile. Profiles as delivered by Profile Manager or by an MDM tool such as uh, the JSS, they, um, well, the JSS in particular actually mirrors what's available in configuration or uh, in Profile Manager, which means you get kind of this canned list of stuff. Some of it is actually useful in an environment and some of it's not, but there's, at the very bottom there, it's hard to see, it says custom settings. You can actually deliver individual keys by way of a custom payload with a profile that works here in Profile Manager. It works in the JSS. I'm sure it works in other tools. Uh, and again, it's microscopic. You can't see it. But that's actually a uh, Microsoft Office um, 
uh, user initials. Actually, no, that one's a uh, user organization. When you're working with this tool, when you're working with any MDM for that matter, when you're working with scripts, again, modular minimal. If you're gonna manage the user settings for Microsoft Office, that's all you should do with this profile. You should not also deliver mail and login window settings and Wi-Fi and certificates. You should not go down the rabbit hole of let's bunch everything together and send it all at once. For profiles in particular, that's risky because if you change something, then you have actually uh, need to modify and remove all of the profiles on the computer and re-deliver it. In the worst case scenario, that means your Wi-Fi network actually gets unmanaged from the computer. Computers lose their, their internet and can't get back on. Best case scenario, it's just messy. Minimal, surgical, precise, one thing at a time, modular workflows. So if you're gonna do Microsoft Office settings, I would say maybe a few of those payloads at once just because that makes sense. If you're gonna do 8021X, then you deliver the network, you deliver the certificates that get you on the network. That's cool. In general, one payload per profile. All right, now we're gonna talk a little bit about scripting, which can be a little bit intimidating and it might not make a lot of sense. We've been talking about all these management tools. I work for a company that makes a management tool. Why aren't we talking about management tools? Well, there's a reason for that. Scripts have the option of being conditional. MCX, configuration profile, these are sort of blunt objects. We say, here's your setting. You get it, and we're kind of done. You might have the option of saying set once, and you can change it later. You might not, depending on, on how you deliver it and what the setting actually is. I'm a big fan of having a script do a test to say, is this a thing that should be changed? Yes, let's change it. So I'm, I'm actually going to show you some of these conditional scripts. We're going to take a look at them. Uh, the, uh, uh, still, modular, minimal. We're going to do a piece at a time. So uh, these recommendations that I'm working with here are from uh, CI Security, so the Center for Internet Security. Um, NIST.gov, literally, I think it was just like last week, published their own draft uh, of the same kind of benchmark ideas um, for Yosemite. So they're a little bit behind the curve. We can still work computer level and user level. We're gonna do both. I talked earlier about user level per unique host, so we're gonna have an example of that too. All right, so let's start with a computer level script. And this is gonna look like a big mess. That's okay, we're gonna break it apart by piece. The point of this particular script is to say, and this is per one of those security recommendations, do you have an infrared port on your Mac? Now, if you do, you should probably get a new Mac, honestly. But <laughs> if you have one, the recommendation from the security uh, benchmarks is to disable that port. So conditional scripting. Do you have the port? If yes, disable it. Cool, we can do that. If no, then we just move on with our lives. So we start off with a system profiler command. And uh, this one is a little bit interesting because it actually does a, a count for us. How many IR receivers do you have? That is just because math is easy, right? If you have more than zero, then we should probably do something about that. Okay, if you have zero, we're done. We're just moving on, everything's fine. But, if you're not zero, presumably there's no negative IR ports on your computer. If you are more than zero, then we're gonna just quickly echo what we're gonna do, and we're gonna use this defaults write command. Defaults is a super cool tool. It is not perfect. It doesn't suit every uh, uh, setting all the time, but uh, defaults allows us to read, write, and delete user and uh, uh, computer settings from the command line. Like I said, it's not, not perfect, it's not foolproof, and we've, I've got an example of that later on. But we've got the key that we saw earlier in the plist. So in this particular case, it's going to be uh, device enabled. And it's a Boolean, true or false, super easy. Is it enabled, is it not? 
You'll notice I didn't do any checking here. Was it enabled previously? I could. If you have an IR port and it's enabled, then disable it. I'm not that interested in it, honestly. If you have an IR port, I'm going to turn it off. So that's computer level. It affects library preferences, the actual, oops, I'm going to back up one. There we go. It actually affects the root library as opposed to the user's library. That's my computer level script example. Now we've got some user level stuff. Again, it's from the same benchmarks. This is stuff that you can actually look up. These are recommendations that come from, I don't know who these entities are, but they make these recommendations. Uh, this one's a little bit interesting. Hot corners. There's an argument to be made that disabling the screensaver is a risk, meaning I don't like that corporate branded screensaver that pops up on my computer when I'm away for five minutes. So I'm going to disable the screensaver by putting my mouse in a particular corner of the screen so that my computer never goes to sleep, never goes to screensaver. This is deemed as a risk. This is an interesting one because there are four corners, therefore there are four different places where this preference might be risky. More than that, every single value in that menu has a different numerical value when you're talking about uh, the actual preference itself. So when we look at this, it looks like this. There we go. Bottom left corner, top left corner, top right corner, bottom right corner. We can actually do a read against those preferences and return those integer values. Thankfully, they are just numbers, no strings here. For some reason, this preference, is, uh, this preference lives in com.apple.doc. Can't explain why, but it does. How would I know that? I don't know, a snapshot could help me find it. And these particular keys, the, uh, I don't even know what that means, <laughs> but bottom left, top right, left, top right, bottom right. Four different values that put my computer at risk. So how would I fix that? If the bottom left corner, that value that I just detected in that previous script, if it equals six, then I'm actually going to change it to equal one instead, one being the disabled value. Conditional scripting. I don't have to say to the end user, bottom left corner is enable screensaver and the rest of it you don't get to touch. You, the user, can do what you like, but if there's something that's at risk, I'm going to fix it. We don't have to bludgeon the user with, this is how the setting is and you're stuck with it. We can just say, you know what, you can do whatever you like as far as enabling mission control or whatever else, but if we're uh, bypassing a security measure, then we're just going to go ahead and repair that for you. Four corners, four different values, top right, bottom right. That's a user level. When this is run at the user level, I don't have to specify that it's coming from library preferences because it's actually reading to local user library preferences. Relative path, not the absolute path at the top of the hard drive. All right, this one's fun. By host. So the example that I've got here is from uh, Stack Exchange. The example that I've actually put out on GitHub is um, a little bit different uh, because it doesn't have a user loop. I'm going to show you that part. But by host, when I log into this Mac, I can set a preference. And let's say I have uh, network homes for some reason. Uh, when I log into the next Mac, the per host setting that I set over here does not travel with me. There's unique identifiers on the piece of hardware that say just on this computer. Once upon a time, that unique identifier was the MAC address. Not so many computers have Ethernet anymore, so they changed that to use the hardware UUID, which again, this is a system profiler command. Find that unique identifier for that particular host. Quick bit of script, it returns this one piece. I mentioned this has a user loop in it. Uh, you can see up at the top, it's actually saying start at the user's directory and loop through and find every single user directory and change it to match these preferences. The version that I have on GitHub is actually for the current logged in user only. I mentioned that defaults is not perfect. In this particular case, 
uh, we have to use plist buddy. And why? Well, because in this particular preference, again, no enforced consistency, everything's a little different. In this particular preference, it's actually a nested preference, which means defaults can't traverse that key hierarchy, and plist buddy can. How do you know that? I don't know, trial and error. I, I tr actually tried to do this, this preference with defaults and couldn't. It was getting an error, so I had to do some research and figure out what was going on there. Plist buddy will let us do it. In this particular case, plist buddy likes it better when we delete the key, which is right there, and then add it back later. There's some interesting stuff going on here with our variables. Our user home, oops, user home was actually determined by that script that said show me everything in the user's directory. The hardware UUID was actually determined right up front by saying what's the unique identifier of this piece of hardware. You can see it lives in this particular case. We are drawing basically an absolute path. We're saying users, username, and then the library preferences by host. There's that, that subdirectory there. So per user, per computer setting. So to quickly recap what we've kind of covered so far, there's the general philosophy of preference managing, management, which is if you don't have to, don't do it. If you do have to, be very, very precise. Manage only the bare bones of what you need to actually get the job done, to actually make the user experience good instead of kind of uh, in their way. We can discover settings by using different uh, tools like snapshots with Composer or checking modification dates in the Finder. Uh, we can also ask the internet politely and we might actually get the answer back to say, you know what, it lives here. I had to do it. One more thing. We can do something a little bit cooler. And this is the stuff that I built actually uh, as I was kind of wrapping up my tour of, of higher ed uh, administration. Again, I'm stuck on modular workflows. I'm gonna kind of hammer that repeatedly. We can do things one at a time, one payload per profile, one key per managed preference, one script per key modification. Now, if you're using a management tool like, oh, I don't know, the JSS, this might mean that you have umpteen scripts in your JSS that all do one little tiny thing. That might be what it means. It doesn't have to be, though. We have some cool options with looping. This is one of my favorite things. Basically, we deliver all of those little tiny, tiny scripts, like here's your, your Bluetooth setting, here's your IR receiver setting. We deliver all of those things as little tiny micro scripts. We dump it in a folder, and then we use some trigger, some event, to actually run all of those scripts at once, either on login or on restart. And then your folders start looking like this. Little tiny folder, little tiny scripts. Part of the reason why I recommend this is because I've worked with the admin who wrote the thousand line script that did all the things. Nobody else wanted to touch that thing with a 10 foot pole. It was enormous, it was monolithic, it was kind of terrifying. It was very cool and it worked, but part of the choices that we have to make is, can my team do it later? Can anybody else interpret, whether you comment your code brilliantly or not, can anybody else figure out what is the thing that makes this setting go? Modular workflows, especially if they're well named, especially if you kind of maintain good script hygiene over time, it's easy to figure out. You know what, that Bluetooth setting doesn't work in Mac OS Sierra. Okay, so we find the one script where that lives and we fix it. Or maybe we deliver conditionally a script that does work in Mac OS Sierra and maintain our El Capitan workflows previously. You'll notice here I went to the liberty of creating a little uh, uh, naming convention. It does look a little like basic, I know. Um, but you can actually run scripts in order. And so with this loop, oops, excuse me, with this loop, it'll run all of the scripts, it'll run it in order. 
If we're doing conditional scripting that says only change the thing if I have to change the thing, then the scripts go very fast. This doesn't actually impact the user experience pretty much at all. It fixes the stuff that needs to be fixed, and we just move on. That script is also out on GitHub. So this is one of my favorite things, is to actually loop for computer, for user. You can use uh, your management tools to actually handle this, like on a login trigger if you wanted. You can also use uh, launch daemons, and I have some examples of that. If we're doing user level, again, you can do this as a management tool option. Maybe it just runs once a week for the current logged in user. In real life these days, computers that are in people's hands are not ever logged out. I mean, that's just kind of how things go right now. If it's a lab full of computers uh, that periodically sit at a login screen for some amount of time between use, then you might have to change up your methodology a little bit. But in real life, one-to-one -one computer, I'm always logged into this thing. I never actually see that login screen. And of course, you can use a launch agent to actually affect the user environment as opposed to a launch daemon to affect the computer one. So I've got an example. This is a launch daemon. The actual important stuff is the stuff in pink. Uh, it's actually just running this little script that happens to be the loop script that runs at load. So computer restarts. It runs that loop. It makes the changes that I've set to be changed, just the changes that I want to be changed. And oddly enough, a launch agent looks very similar, lives in a slightly different location, points to a user settings loop instead of the computer settings loop. Run it, login. OK. Got my references here. All this is in the slides. CI security, NIST, and that one uh, Bluetooth uh, reference out on Stack Exchange. All my stuff is out on GitHub. That's my email address. I'll leave that up, and I'll take any questions anybody has. I really want to chuck this thing, so. <laughs> Oh, okay, that's ambitious. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> Just uh, an FYI, if you go to the STIG website and you grab the mobile config of it, it's really not a good idea because these they have a lot of settings in one mobile config, which is a really horrible thing to do. You just have to kind of like clear it out, get one thing at a time out of it, and create new mobile config. Don't just take it from them and plug it in your network. You're going to get in trouble. <laughs> That is an incredibly valid point. Be really careful about what you trust on the internet and how you apply it to your environment. Always test. <laughs> Anybody else? Yeah. So if you are using Casper, another option to the, the loop thing that you did was to just do a cached policy with multiple scripts. Sure. And so they'll just live in the jam, library application support jam folder and they'll run, you know, at network state change or login or whatever you want to do. Sure. And do it that way. It's an option. Lots of roads to the same destination. I, I, That's a I great example. I figured you did it the way you did for people that weren't using Jamf. You could give, you know, they, they could have another option. But. I tried to generalize, but yes, right. absolutely. Anybody else? Cool. Oh, wait, somebody in the back. Can you talk a little bit about plist buddy? Sure. Um, every once in a while, it disappears from the OS. <laughs> I, I can't explain that. But it has happened in the past where a new release comes out, and suddenly plist buddy is gone. Um, I mean, I, do you have a specific question? Or? I've never heard of it. I'm not sure if everyone else knows what it is, but I, just, I don't know what that is. I've always used defaults to, to write and read. Defaults is great. It's not perfect all the time, uh, specifically because of that nested uh, key issue that might come up from time to time. Um, PLS Buddy is maybe a little less intuitive because it works better if you delete the key before writing the change. But that's just two lines of code instead of one. Um, it is a native binary on the OS, so you can certainly do a man on it and figure out uh, how it works. But otherwise, I mean, the, the functionality is pretty much the same as defaults as far as find the key, figure out what the value should be, and tell it to do that. There's some flags in there that you can change, too. Yeah, and every once in a while, it just, like, 
I don't know, the, the engineer who wrote it forgot to put it in, in the release. Every once in a while that happens, so. Cool. Any other questions? Awesome. Check out GitHub. Hit me up if you have any other questions later. Thank you all for your time. It was a pleasure meeting you this week, guys.